All right, folks, welcome back to Kranz's Corner, and we are back. The usual suspects, everybody back in their Hollywood Squares corners here on my computer screen. Dougley Durong is here, Mike Olivia from DolphinsTalk.com, even though I butchered his name, and Jason Sarney. I know, I, this is the first time in a while I butchered your name. It just came out real quick like that. And Jason Sarney back with us after a couple of weeks vacation uh, where he was just doing draft stuff for a couple of weeks. That We sent him off to draft camp. He's back from draft camp, so I'm sure he'll have lots of stuff for us this week and the upcoming weeks. We are in draft month, fellas. Uh, normally, as the Dolphin radio guy for 20 years, I start talking about the draft in like late October, November mm -hmm. to see where the Dolphins are going to be and get – this year, uh, we had a couple more weeks after that before we really started talking. But it is draft month. This is serious. This is a big uh, a big couple rounds of, of, of draft picks for the Miami Dolphins. We'll get into that in a little bit. We're going to start with the big news. Remember, we take this on Wednesday. It posts Thursday morning. The big news from Wednesday, Stefan Diggs is now a Houston Texan for a second. What is a second round pick? They threw a five and a six or a four and a five just to get him out there. I mean, Unbelievable stuff. I'll read this note that I saw today on ESPN Stats Info. Uh, this will be the highest known dead money charge for a wide receiver in any season all time. Jeez. They confirmed it this morning or Wednesday morning when, this, when the trade was uh, made or, or announced. It will not be processed as a post-June 1st designation. So that's $31 million in dead cap space for Diggs and the Buffalo Bills this year. Congratulations, Buffalo Bills. We love when you make moves like that. Your first thoughts, fellas, today when you heard that. Mike, I'll start with you here since I butchered your name. Yeah, I'm probably going to be in the minority here, but that doesn't mean I'm wrong. Um, I think it's the best day for the Bills in a long time. It might not oh. feel like it right now. I think at times with certain players and certain organizations, it is totally addition by subtraction. And he clearly had an issue with the coaches, the front office, the other players on the roster, the quarterback. And I probably used this analogy before. I'm not sure. Maybe with some other players. It reminds me a lot of the 2007 New York Giants. Jeremy Shockey was their best pass catcher, but it was a pain in the ass and always yelling at Eli Manning. In December of that year, he goes down to injury out for the season. Not a practice, not in the locker room, not playing games. Eli is a whole new player. They go on to win the Super Bowl and beat the undefeated Patriots. The Giants see this. They trade Shockey in the offseason. Eli's a new man. They win a second Super Bowl a few years later. Sometimes you just got to, this ain't working. It's not you. It's me. It's whatever. And they've moved on. I think without this clown, and he's a little bit of a clown, yelling mm. to Josh Allen's face, I think Josh Allen in time will excel. Yes, Buffalo has to replace him. I get it. But it's also April 3rd. Okay? Maybe they right. trade for Brandon Ayuk. <laughs> Or a T. Higgins. Right. Maybe they draft a wide receiver in both round one and round two. Maybe they trade for one draft one. I don't know. They'll figure it out. That's the Bills' problem, not mine. And I know they got $31 million in dead money, but with the salary cap goes up every year, it like who cares? Like we know the cap's not real. If they trade for Higgins and they give him a whole new deal, the year one salary cap number will be like one million, and then they'll jump up to like twenty-eight million in year right. two. There's ways around it. We all know that stuff. And for everyone who says you know, he's not the same player. He fell off in the second half last season. Yes, and that's why Buffalo did this, because the second half of last season is when the Bills got hot, when they ran the ball more, and Josh Allen played more under control. It pains me to say this. I hate to say this. I think this is a good move for the Buffalo Bills. Are they worse today than they were last season? Yes, but guess what, folks? So are the Dolphins. We're on the same boat here. Neither team has gotten better this offseason. So I think the Bills, they had to do it, and I think long-term, it's going to pan out for them, and we'll see how they replace them. Again, it's April 3rd. Right. They haven't it's replaced them yet. Let's see what they do. Right. It's early. We're not even, we're still a couple of weeks away from the draft. I hate Forget to say this, but I think right. it's a good move for them. Mm -hmm. I know. I, I get it. I get it. Dougley, your thoughts. Yeah. It's, it's going to be interesting to see how, you know, as long as they have Josh Allen, though, to be honest with right. you, it, it doesn't really matter the receivers that they have. But it, this, he's been wanting out of Buffalo because Buffalo can't get over the hump ever. Like in the history of Buffalo, they right. can't get over the hump. So he probably he wants out and he goes to the Houston Texans, which is a team that's on the rise, filling players around. Uh CJ Stroud, like ridiculous. Um, I think it's indifferent. I'm surprised that they got a 2025 second. Like that's right. where I'm in. Right. Like I was like, really? A 2020? Like they they gave him away. And yes, he's up there in age, but he still he still could do something. So 
it's going to, and now is the time where Bean is going to have to figure out, am I trading up in the draft? Am I trading for Higgins? Am I doing this? You know, there's still a bunch of good Boyd and OBJ still out there. So I, I think they'll be fine. I don't think it really, I think where they're hurt is the secondary losing all the players they did, but they also have a good head coach. So as long as they have Allen, they're still like a minimum 10 win team. Right. And Doug, it's a great point too, because I thought today when I saw the trade, I was like, all right, they're going to have an extra second round this year. They're going to definitely – I I, th I thought at that point two out of their first three picks are going to be wide receivers. They're going to just load up, and this is the way to go. Young, very uh, – young, uh, inexpensive wide mm -hmm. receivers for Josh Allen for the next couple of years. Then I saw 25, and I was a little confused, but I thought it was a typo, but obviously it wasn't towards the end of the day. The, research, the return of Jason Sarney, what do you think? I'm going to attempt to return with a joke, and I'm going to go on the mic – Oliva realm, realm here, and this might end my run here. But remember the old George Carlin joke, where he he never had a night with a ten, but one night he had five twos. That's <laughs> Josh Allen right now. Yeah, right. He's got no ten, but he's got literally four, five, two or three receivers ranked wise. So you go from a Stephon Diggs, who's out. A Gabe Davis, who's out. The Curtis Samuel, Khalil Shakir, uh, Shakir Mac Hollins, and KJ Hamlin. So you're relying on a guy like Josh Allen to rush the ball probably 150 times, which is probably his sweet spot. So you're putting him more susceptible to injury. You're putting the whole offense on his back, and you're going to ask him to do it, assuming, as Mike said, being that it's early, if you don't bring in another receiver, another huge weapon, he's the offense. Offense. And mm -hmm. I don't know how much fear those guys I mentioned, the Samuels, the Shakirs, the Hounds, and the Howlers, put into the AFC <laughs> defensive coordinators out there. So I don't think it's like, you know, horrible for Buffalo, but it's going to just, again, put all, all the onus on Josh Allen. And they're not as scary as they were mm -mm. six months ago. Right. No, I, I get you there. What does this do for you three? When it comes to the AFC East, what it looks like now. Now, this is a way too early kind of you know answer you're going to give because we are a couple of weeks away from the draft. We're not even close to June first to see what happens there. But today, as it stands, uh, is Buffalo still the best team in the AFC East? I'll go in reverse order. I'll start with you, Sarni. You know, it's a really interesting question, and I think I could make a case pre-draft that Dolphins could get there if they have a good draft. Mm -hmm. Because I was really with the mindset that if you lose a Christian Wilkins, if you lose an Andrew Van Ginkle, if you lose a Robert Hunt, you, what the hell's going on? But then all of a sudden, I kind of saw a method to the madness. And as the dust settled, I'm not thrilled, but I'm not disappointed. Right. I'm a wait and see kind of guy right now. And I really would love to see what they do with those first two draft picks. Cause this is the first time in two years, they have a first rounder. You're giving McDaniel input in the first rounder for the first time. And you have massive need. And I think three positions that have a plethora of excellent players who will land to you at 21, if they elect to stay there. So I think the dolphins have put themselves, you know, in pace to keep pace with the bills. I don't think they've leapfrogged them yet. But the Bills tripped, and the Dolphins have an opportunity to go past them right now. Right. And, and unless the Bills make a dive with a Higgins or somebody else, right. splash-wise, I think the draft, the Dolphins may be able to pull ahead on me. What do you think, Dougley? Yeah, it, it's surprising that even after all the losses that the Dolphins had, they were still, like, projected to have 10 and a half wins. Like, I was very surprised by that. I was expecting the Jets to leap over the Dolphins, which they haven't. Um it's it's going to be the Dolphins did the right thing in okay we're not going to be able to pay these two guys that much money but we're going to be able to bring in solid players now they still need that solid defensive tackle but let's right. not sleep on Sealer like I know we're all like oh we don't have Wilkins we have to draft a defensive tackle first or we have to get a stuff Sealer is not a slouch like he's still going to be very good and you know it's always the chicken and the egg thing was wilkins better because sealer was next to him or was sealer better and you know so we won't know we're going to find out now but it's it's all about that draft you know can we pick up a sol another solid defensive tackle we need another interior offensive lineman a third wide receiver you get you hit on those three and you get starters there's there's no there's no dip we're still right. the same team we were last year 
and will be able to compete. Whereas Buffalo lost all most of most of their defense and right. backfield. So there's that dip. Wide receivers and stuff. You got the Jets who added great players, but can they stay healthy? And the Patriots are rebuilding. So if the Dolphins can just do this draft right and do the post draft right and add the players they need to, they could be favorites to win the division. It'd be interesting to see. Mike, finish us off here. Yeah, the people in the chat are gonna love me this week. Um <laughs> I, it's still the Bills. Um, uh, because I don't think they make this trade. Unless they got a plan B in mind. And I'm right. sh- and I would not be shocked if the next 48 to 72 hours we get an idea what their plan B is. Um, I might be wrong as well. But um, you know, and their plan B might be out to go out and sign like a a Tyler Boyd or an Odell Beckham and then move up in round one to get like a Brian Thomas. They're not gonna be able to move up in the tops because the top of this draft is shaping up. You're gonna have three quarterbacks and three wide receivers, like as your top six. I'd be shocked if it's not. So but they could move up to like 16, get in front of a team like Jacksonville to get like a Brian Thomas, and then start from there. Um, or maybe they make a larger move. They're still the classist division. I am not as high on this Miami offseason as you know some some folks are. I they it's not just losing Wilkins, they also lost Raekwon. And Zach Sealer can't do it at all. And they signed five guys who are career backups right. and probably two or three of them won't even make the 53 man roster. And I think that's why in round one, they almost have to go um, at one of those spots and they need that spot to not just be good, but to be good and maybe start year one and hold his own. And then that's not even talking about the offensive line, which I know we'll talk about here soon. Cause I got a lot to say about that. Right. Um, I, I think the jets are on the rise. They, I mean, Jets got a really good defense. I mean, you can say whatever you want about Rodgers and Mike Williams and the offensive lineman they signed from the Cowboys is always hurt. Their defense is going to be really good. And if Rodgers is even half of what he was with the Packers, they're going to be a pain in the neck. So I think it's still the Bills, and I think Miami and the Jets are nipping at their heels. I don't give Miami a huge advantage over the Jets, maybe ever so slight, just because um, you got Hill, you got Waddle, you got some – explosiveness there but i think it's still the bills but not by much but jets and miami i think are like even at this point right i think the division's up for grabs for the first time in a long time yeah i I think that with all the moves that all these teams are going to make and now you look and figure the patriots are going to have a rookie quarterback coming in here we're not really worried that much about them but the jets that the jets defense is going to be something to you know that we're going to be talking about all season long they might win a bunch of games 13-10. 13-10. You know what I mean? Like, they might win a bunch of these games like that. Uh, you can so do we'll any see. combination of first, second, third with those teams, and I right. wouldn't be shocked if you right. don't. Absolutely. If we're talking, you know, the first week of January, Jets first, second, Miami third, Bills. First, Bills, second, Miami third, Jets. Any right. combination of those three, first, second, third, would not shock me as of today. Um, we'll see outside, of, outside of a major injury, the only thing that yeah, would shock that would me change is, everything. well, no, he, but uh, yeah, that's the only thing that could change anything in my mind. Like something happens said. to Tua, something happens to Rogers, something happens to Josh and Allen. New the seasons are going to be tanked. Right, mm-hmm. right. Like outside of a major injury, it's it's Jets, Bills, Dolphins. Put their the names in the hat, pick one out, and that's going to be your AFC champion, AFC East champion at the end of the season. I totally agree with that. Uh, we made a joke uh, on the last uh, roundtable we had before uh, the the Matthew Krantz spring break tour that I did in Orlando for six days. Um, that right when we sign off, something big is going to happen. Some sort of news is going to happen. And sure enough, five and a half minutes. And I don't even know if it was that long yeah, after. I don't think it was that long. <laughs> right. After we signed off and I started downloading this to to, to upload, uh, Odell Beckham's name came up that he was meeting with the Dolphins, had met with the Dolphins. Nothing was on paper. Nothing was signed. Nothing about that. So we have that to talk about. Uh, Craig Craft is back. Berrios is back. Mostert signed a two-year deal or an extra year on that deal. And Kendall Lamb just signed back as well. Uh, your thoughts on those comebacks and uh, the Odell Beckham kind of uh, talks and now the Tyler Boyd rumors that they might be interested. All, all these interesting stuff, all the stuff's going to end up coming up and and you're going to hear so many smoke screens, especially before the draft anyway. But those kind of just single names by themselves. Your thoughts on that, Michael? Start again with you. Yeah, um, the wide receiver talk's interesting because, you know, there's two groups of Dolphins fans. They say one that 
know and kind of understand wide receivers a big need for this team, even with Hill and Waddle, and ones that don't understand football because they think we got Hill and Waddle. We don't need a wide receiver. No, because <laughs> right. when those two guys were less than 100 at the end of last year, that oh. offense came to a standstill and right. they couldn't move the ball. Um, even the game against the Cowboys, they won. Yeah, we beat. We scored one touchdown. I mean, they were lucky that they won that game. So wide receiver. Now, I'm this to me reminds me a lot of last year with the running backs. Chris Greer is going to talk to everybody. There are going to be reports. He's interested in Boyd. He's interested right. in Odova. But he's probably got like this much money he's going to spend, which he, and he ain't going to spend one penny more. And if those guys want one penny more, it's just it's just reports that he's interested. He's interested in anybody. But I don't know if he's uh, – post-June 1st, if those guys are unsigned, they got some more money. I still think a lot of that money is going to be earmarked for extensions for other guys right. to pay two. Uh, I don't know if they're going to want to go on a spending spree like – some people think they might. I don't know. I'm just saying I don't think so. But wide receivers in need. The offensive line, let me just go off on a mini rant. Do here. it. Let's hear it. Everyone, you know, people still don't understand Chris Greer. When Chris Greer says, you're more worried about the offensive line than we are, folks, take him at face value. He ain't making it up. Right. Look who we look who we got. Armstead and Lamb. There's your two left tackles. You got Win. He was your start, so you got her. Can't trust him. Liam wasn't bad last year, so I got him as your number two there. Aaron Brewer is going to replace Connor Williams. Some say it's a wash. They say slight downgrade. Either way, he's your new center. You got Liam to back him up there. Right tackle. I'm going to skip over right guard for a minute. Right tackle. You got Austin Jackson. Keon Smith, when he played last year, is great. A lot of upside right. there. Everyone loves Keon Smith. Oh, my God. So it's like, and then at right guard, you got Robert Jones, Lester Cotton, Jack, Jake, Whatever his name is there from Driscoll, the, right, the, right? Yeah, Driscoll. Right. He's still got Liam as a backup. He could maybe go there. I do not think on draft weekend, Thursday night, when we all hear this sound, <laughs> that the Dolphins are going to draft an offensive lineman around one. All right. Because he put the band back together. And I know we he don't did. like that as fans. And we view the offensive line like one way, and they view it clearly totally different. And they've proven that. Um if it's a left tackle that they absolutely are in love with, they might play him at left tackle for a year or play him at guard for a year. Like right. if they fall in love with like a JC Latham, they might, or someone, whoever, who's happens to be there. That's the only way they ain't taking Austin powers, Jackson, whatever his name is there. Um, they're not taking the kid from Duke. I don't see that maybe a tackle, but that's even, I think that this is their line this year. And maybe they had someone around too. Maybe they had someone around five, but I'd be very surprised if they dra- believe Chris Greer when he talks. Believe right. that. He doesn't put up a lot of smoke screens, right? No, I mean, he talks to everybody. Very transparent. But, yeah. Right. He's very transparent. And I always, I never take him at his word, but I probably should at this point. I've, I should learn my lesson. Dougley. Uh, I, the moves that they made were solid, but I think we wanted to move the needle and we couldn't move the right. needle because of financially. But bringing in Kendall Lamb, I was surprised. And him coming out and saying this is his last year makes sense to me because I was hearing he wanted to retire. Um, and now he's essentially saying that. He was like, one last ride. Very, very good move. I That's like an underrated move because we don't know what's going on with Teron Armstead physically. Like that man, last year he started the season injured. And we were like, right. you couldn't even like start the season so having Kendall Lamb be able to come in and play left tackle when he did it very well is awesome. Bringing back Isaiah Wynn, our rush offense was ridiculous when he was healthy, and it dropped off severely when he wasn't. Um, I don't know about center. Like Aaron Brewer, he's decent, but he's not great at pass blocking, so we'll see how that goes. That huge commotion at right guard is going to be interesting. And then we have our uh, right tackle. Now, when it comes to the third wide receiver, they offered him a contract. And if the if your head coach comes out and says we offered him a contract, it means that there's something fluid there. Right. And I bet you all of these free agents, all of them from Boy to hey, um to OBJ to even Reisner and Lincoln Tomlinson, because the Dolphins are now connected to saying to some of these guards, hey, we'll talk to you after the draft if mm-hmm. we can't get who we want, are all now just sitting back. They're gonna wait the next what twenty two days. And they're just going to sit back and then whoever doesn't get drafted, boom, you got the second wave and the Dolphins are setting themselves up to be in a great situation on that second wave. Cause once we get the 18 and a half from Xavier Howard, they're going to be sitting at like 23.3 million, give or take. And if they can somehow 
get a contract restructuring for Tua before that time, they could be sitting at 30 plus million. So be able to go out, do what they need to do, and then still do the thing they always do, which is carry like 15 million into the season. Um, it's going to be interesting, but so far they didn't do anything splashy. And I think that's why that whole narrative came up of, are they taking, or uh, is this a pause year? Like what the right. heck is a pause year? Um, because they didn't do anything flashy. They didn't go out and make any big moves. They lost guys and they were like, you know what? We'll take our two threes, go into next year with three, uh, third round picks, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think they're still solid. Like I've said before, and I think they can still really compete because, the dynamic players are still in position in Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle, Tua, Achan, Mostert, Javon Holland. We bring in Kendall Fuller, Jalen Ramsey. Like, it, we're not bad, essentially, right. is what I'm saying. Uh, but they didn't do anything crazy, like go out and get the best defensive tackle. You know, okay, we're going to lose Christian Wilkins. We're bringing in Chris Jones. Right. You know, suck right. a butt. Like, now all of a sudden, <laughs> right. no one can say anything. Like, we're not, we didn't do that, but we're still good. We're still solid. To me, it's about Tua's play and coaching. That's right. what's holding us back, and if we can push past that after November, this team can go very far. Let's hope. Let's hope when the weather gets a little bit cold that everything still is okay with this team. Sarney. You know, it goes with uh, that wait-and-see approach, but with the players that they re-signed, including Kendall Lamb, look, I love how he came out of social media and said, look, this is going to be my last ride. Uh, he's a simple guy. He's going to take his contract. He's thankful. So I love that mindset, and I really like what the Dolphins have done uh, on the offensive line with keeping Isaiah Wynn, um, Robert Jones. I love that because there was so much mishmash that worked with this group with Butch Barry. So when you lose a Robert Hunt, at least you have guys that you could filter in when you not know what's going on with Connor Williams. Truth be told, forget his name, guys. It ain't happening because it's looking like he's out the door, potentially football, let mm -hmm. alone you know coming back to the dump. So they're going to need to figure out what they're doing outside of Aaron Brewer, who was signed. So the Dolphins could draft an interior lineman or a tackle. And as Mike referenced, Brewer, yes, is a creature of habit. But in doing some draft research, I do want to go back to a name. Um, Graham Barton, kid from Duke, as much as Mike is right, there's a lot of left tackling. There is a lot, a lot of left tackling that he played at Duke. Uh, and an option, if there's a, there's a little bit of a loaded response here. The option that the Dolphins can have with a guy like Barton is they could play him on the interior, most predominantly at center, or move Brewer to guard, or flip that, because he could still do that with Barton at guard and have Brewer at center, and ride your last year out with Teron Armstead. And then when Teron Armstead misses three to seven games, which we kind of mm. know that's going to happen, right. you could put Barton at left tackle, although he's got a little less length than ideally you would like to go up against speed rushers, so that's your caveat with Barton on the left side, but it's potentially a chance you could kind of do that because he could be your future center too. So that's him. But I do like what they kind of tried to do in aggregate with losing Christian Wilkins. They tried to make up for him with four guys, which is rotationally what Anthony Weaver is going to do with his interior defensive front with when you add in Zach Sealer and Brandon Peely. Let's not forget him. I want to see if this opens up a chance for Brandon Peely to kind of get himself in the mix. Undrafted guy who made the team from last year, kind of made cameos here or there. So uh, I'm not in love with what's going on, but I'm not, you know, throwing fits either. And this draft is very intriguing with linemen, the trenches. Because if you're looking at also defensive line, most predominantly the edge rushers on the outside, Love the kid from UCLA, Liatu Latu. Uh, if he's sitting there at 21, oh, my God, is he intriguing. But uh, the problem is, is that they don't have enough picks. But the other problem is, Chris Greer and I have an article coming out, shameless plug, on Dolphins Talk. Plug away. Coming up. Yeah, it's fine. As, as much as I love Chris Greer, he's made a number of draft day, draft day trades in weekends past, 2019, 2020. None of them worked out. None of them. And he didn't make any draft day trades in the last two years. And when you look at 2020, he made a draft day trade for Liam Eikenberg. Part of the none of them have worked out. And Liam Eikenberg is the only one of those players that he selected in those draft day trades since 2019 still rostered. There's a lot more to that article to unpack. But the fact of the matter is, even if it looks like the Dolphins should trade back, he may stay put because he probably knows his record in players selected after draft day trade. So a lot of options. This team could really 
to do well. I'm just very curious to see what that first domino is with that number one pick. Everything right. else. Can I jump in real quick? Yeah, yeah, go, go. Because Jason made a ton of great points, and so did Doug. They're spot on with everything they said. But what but. they both described yeah. is a step back pause season. It's like, <laughs> right. no, you're right. Like you're right. right. We're not going to go out there and sign like a Chris Jones. We're going to, you know, sign four or five guys, see what we got. Then we're going to draft somebody, put them in there. Let's see what we got. Let's see what we got with Cam Smith. Let's, let's see what we got in the house. On the offensive line, we're going to, you know, bring everyone back. Let's not go crazy. And let's, you know, stockpile third round picks, which are really picks at the end of round three, which is like the first part of round four, and hold on to them like they're gold. That is a pause, step back season. They're not the quote unquote all in moves. That, and I think when people hear that term, not all people, some fans get like mad, like, we're, they're not going to, like, they're still going to win nine or 10 games. I'm not saying right. they're going to be bad or it's like a tank season. I right. think people hear like pause or step back and they think tank. It's not that. It's just that it's status quo as we now develop some young guys that we need to step up into larger roles. And that whole like pause and it's a step back that came from Cam Wolf, the Miami Herald. I had it a week before them, but not to pat myself on the back. Um, like that's being told to people by people in power. And then when Mike McDaniel goes to the owners meetings, no, that's not what do you want him to say? Right. I mean, what, right. what do you want him to say? Can you imagine <laughs> if he said that at the owners' line. meetings? Right. So it's right. like th that's what a policy is like. Let's develop some young guys. We signed five guys here to replace Christian Wilkins and Raekwon, which nobody ever mentions. Um, if one or two stick or one or two can sort of, you know, hold the fourth down as we take someone around one or two to throw in the mix, and hopefully that guy you know, by like week seven or eight can really step up into a larger role and be like a long-term. That's what a step back pause season is. We're not spending big money on anybody and that's fine. And we want to stockpile future picks. That's fine. We're still going to win nine or 10 games right. unless we have like major injuries. Um, And we're still going to be competitive and we're still, will be in the mix for the wild card or the AFC East, all depending on how things go. But that's what that is to a T, a step back pause season. And mm -hmm. I think people misunderstand that term and what that actually is and then it's like, no, we're not going to, it's not tanking. It's not trying to lose. It's just, they're going to sit status quo and moving forward. Here's what they're doing. I, I'll touch right here, folks. Not a prediction. It's a spoiler. Kudos to Paul Heyman. Um, as Tyree <laughs> Hill, the one big contract we didn't restructure this off season, uh, as I now jinx myself, probably happened five minutes. After it's going to happen the second after we, we stop. Ramsey, like... We did it with Chubb. We did it with Armstead. We didn't do it. Tyree. Why? As we have to pay Waddle, they're going to want Tyreek off the books. Waddle right. steps up in that 1A, pay him. What's going to happen on the off? What's going to chub in Jalen Phillips? One guy leaves, the other guy's going to step up, and they got to pay. Like, this is what they're doing. This is the plan. They're going to pay the young guys at the premium positions that Chris Greer values as they phase out the older guys that, you know, Chubb, God love him, not his fault. He's hurt, but he's always hurt. And Tyreek, we know, little cuckoo off the field. They got to get him out of here as quick as possible. And the new guys, the younger guys, are going to get paid to stay. And that's what, what has set sort of a like re get everything in line with the cap, get some picks heading into next year. Got some young guys like a Cam Smith. We're going to take some guys this year. Let's get them into some larger roles. And that's what a pause, step back, see, step back season type thing is. It's not that they're going to lose, they're going to still win nine or 10 games, maybe 11 if we're great. I don't think any more than that, but okay, there's, that's still good. So here's I, I want to add one quick thing if you don't mind. I love what you said, Mike. You're you're very right. And I think it's important to set expectations because while they can still be contenders in the AFC East and make noise and still win those 10 games, you know, they didn't go from Super Bowl contenders when healthy from last year to improving that when all healthy on paper where they are now. It just it's inevitable that they have to have a step back where we can't be predicting 12 to 13, 14 wins like a lot of people kind of did. At this time last year, we're looking at the roster, you know. So you're right. Step back. Is it they're going to lose, lose, lose? Absolutely not. Set the expectations at like nine or ten. So if they do go one or two over, we're all dancing in the streets and hoping for that. And they're playoff. good enough with the talent they got to win nine, ten, or even of course. Games still. Right. Losing exactly. Wilkins is bad. Yes. Right. Raekwon's bad. Yes. Right. Losing Hunt's bad. Yes. First off, the Hunt thing's a little overrated. He's a guard. No guards worth that much. And Correct. he didn't play for half last year anyway. So they can replace right. him. It's more about on the defensive line. Who, like I said, they signed five guys for career backups, and really round one of this draft. I, I mean, unless it's Brian Thomas Jr., he's the only guy 
I would have any, I'd be like, oh, he's special. Unless it's him, just pick the best defensive lineman. You can falls in your lap because that needs to be rebuilt badly. Because I don't know how we're going to stop the run this year. Uh, no, right. Any of the guys we no, I, I'm thinking the whole time as we're talking, I'm thinking, okay, if I'm the offensive or defensive coordinator going after this Dolphins team right now, today, because there are a lot more moves to make. They're still going to draft a couple of guys. Uh, they're still going to get guys after June 1st. I get that. But right now, there is some massive weaknesses on this team um, that you may you might not have had really last year. So it goes down to that question that we've asked here on this show and all the – everyone's had their own – whether it's on a Dolphins talk or Dougley, it doesn't matter. We've all – the window, this window of this roster last year that I, I have been a Dolphins fan since birth. God bless my parents for being born down here in South Florida. And you guys aren't even from South Florida and you're all Dolphin fans, but we're all miserable Dolphin fans to a point because we followed this team since birth. Is that window, the, the roster I saw last year when the season started with Jalen Ramsey even hurt was probably the best roster I've seen in my lifetime here with the Dolphins uh, outside of, we really need to dissect maybe the JT defensive teams when Ricky was there and see how that kind of offense and everything was last year was the best roster I've ever seen for this franchise. They didn't even win a damn playoff game. Forget about losing in the Super Bowl by a field goal or uh, some fluke. They didn't even win it. That window, is it shut? Like, is is it closed? Because now we're all here sitting talking about, no, you know, they're going to win eight or nine games or win 10 games. They got to, is is that going to, eight or nine or 10 games is not even a guarantee of a playoff. A a playoff berth. But but that's why this is like a step back here. It's like, we're not blowing it up starting over. We're just not going to go nuts financially. We're not going to go nuts with trades. We're not going to go nuts with all these moves like in-season trade for – we're not doing that. we got to see what we have in Cam Smith. we got to see – we got to see if A-Chan can stay healthy for a full year and possibly be a running back one a year from now. We have to make sure we hold on to those compensatory picks so we have ammunition in future to, in 2025. To trade if we to need to also. some of these players right. to trade, have right. some – to be able to move up and down the draft board. We need to see – who we take this year around one or two, if they can be foundational pieces, you might not know year one, but you might have an idea, kind of okay. like we did with Waddle right. and Jalen. We got to see, and you're not going to go out there and spend crazy money and find out. That's why it's like, we got to, you know, let, let's take a beat. Let's so not let, go, let's be financially prudent this year. So let me ask this, and Doug, I'll let you answer this quickly because now it's on my window kind of question. All right. So, Mike, Mike, you're right. I think you're 100% right what you said. This is kind of the Pause, step back, not step all the way back, but kind of no, just off just, the table a little bit. You know, you, you've you eaten enough. You're going to sit back to the table. You're not a going bit 75, chill. you're going 40 right. for a bit on the throw. Okay. Yeah. Go so ahead. I don't want to say the window's shut, but the window's open, but I just put the screen up because the screen is now up on that window. So the window's not totally shut yet. But I look at that and I say, how does this, how does, and I've always said here, especially with you guys too, that I think Stephen Ross is a great owner. Uh, I do. I really think Stephen Ross is a good owner because whenever there's money to be given, he gives it. I don't know if he makes the best football decision sometimes Mm -hmm. by bringing in guys, but whenever those guys that he brings in, whether we like them or not, said, we can get better, but I need $140 million today, Ross cuts the check. We need to restructure this guy, but I need a check. Ross cuts the check. That's fine. How does Stephen Ross and whoever he speaks to say to themselves right now, we have the right people in place up top if we just did all of this, couldn't win a playoff game, and now we have to step back for a season or two, how do guys not get fired at this point knowing whatever's going on here? I know I was a fire Chris Greer guy for years, and I came back off that a little bit, and now I'm kind of I'm nipping back at it. I'm kind of knocking on that door a little bit a little more. How does that happen? Like, I just don't understand how this happens and how people keep their jobs with a step back year, a pause year, or what year, knowing that last year, like I've said a couple times now, that damn roster – was the best we've seen as Dolphin fans. Dougley, what do you think about that? Yeah, there's no way that they can not make the playoffs this year and not right. ha- clean house completely because how are you going to sell Steven Ross that oh we're we're going to we're going to kind of take a step back. We're going to be competitive and we're going to we're going to win some games. Right. But if we don't make the playoffs, it's just part of the plan type of situation because he heard the same thing in 2019. Look, we're going right. to tear it all down. We're going to start all over. We're going to suck this year but we're going to get our quarterback. We're going to build this and that he is not getting any younger. So it's like, he's getting tired of this. So if, if they do not, I wouldn't be surprised. This is like extreme, but 
if they don't make the playoffs, I wouldn't be surprised if he's gone. If he's like, I can't do this anymore. Oh, I think he, yes. I, and just, I don't think he's going to hire one more head coach. That's yeah. a great point. I, I don't think he wants to sit through another regime no. of people, of a new coach, a new GM, a new strategy on how to get better. Because I do think he was sold like he was sitting in Manhattan at one of these real estate things where he was getting sold on a property. And they said, give us a couple. It's going to take a couple years mm-hmm. to build. It's not going to be in six months where this is going to this big building you want is going to be built. But we're going to have the grandest building in Manhattan sitting here in Miami Gardens. It's going to be unbelievable. We're going to get our quarterback. We're going to sign some good players. We're going to bring in some stars. And we're going to win a Super Bowl. And si- almost six years later, not even a playoff win. But That's it's, just, it's, it's mind-boggling. It's not even Some guys go to the playoffs later. and get fired the next year because they didn't win two playoff games. We can't even get to the playoffs some years. After they gave him that spiel, it was two years later, right. five first-round draft picks, all this money, and they started one and seven. Right. It's like, I remember when they started, We when we lost, I think it was to the uh, Falcons. I said they both got to go. At right. that point, I was like, when they lost to the Jaguars, I was like, one of them got to go. And then when we lost to the Falcons the way we did, I was like, you cannot keep both of right. these guys when you Urban have Meyer's five first-round picks. The Urban and Meyer win. win. Right, right. Good God. Right. And they did. They kept Chris right. Greer. It just boggles right. my mind. It does. It really does. And, and I'm, I'm not trying to to get everyone to jump on the boat of the fire. Because I don't. I, Chris, Greer, Chris Greer can't be fired today. I can't do that. No. We can't bring no. him to him now. But it's just mind-boggling to me that if one of the four of us was that bad at our job, for oh, a couple of years. Look, let's be honest. You wouldn't, wouldn't have your job anymore. <laughs> the fact he wasn't fired after the Flores fiasco. Correct. There tells me he ain't Thank ever getting you. fired. I mean, right. as long as Ross is the owner. Uh, he brought the Fox into the hen house. And because Stephen Ross doesn't know who the linebacker coach of the Patriots is. No, Chris, no. Chris Greer said, this is our guy. Right. And he didn't share the same vision as the general manager. Right? That To me, that was the time. Be like, you know what? Screw both of you, you're both gone. And they're mm-hmm. them both at that point, but he didn't. And last year, I don't even put on Greer last year, because I know the injuries are play factor, but Greer did give Mike McDaniel the best roster any head coach has had since right. Don Chula, probably. And yes, the injuries are a factor. A lot of it, though, they didn't blow a two-touchdown lead versus the Titans because of injuries. Right. They didn't blow a touchdown lead in the fourth quarter versus the Bills because of injuries. That was more coaching decisions and situational play calling and stuff like that. But because if they win just one of those games, mm-hmm. they have a home playoff game probably against whoever who's a who was the final. Uh, been the it would have been. It might have been Steelers, Steelers, and they probably right? beat Mason Rudolph. And you know what? Right. Yes, that would have been. That would have at least sold the fan base on hope. Yeah, first we make the playoffs, lose, then we get win the AFC East so with all the injuries. Maybe win a playoff game. Maybe lose the next round. It's progress. Right. We don't even see progress. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. It's like. And I, you know, I say it time and time again. People get mad, which again, people in chat go love me this week. Fans get the team they deserve. You know, they put out this crappy product. Now Ross hasn't been here for twenty four years, but they want to play a game twenty four years. And the fans keep going to the game, keep buying right. the merchandise, they go on social media. Two is the best. Everything's the best. I love this. I love that. It's like they see that and they go, "Well, if this fan base is going to keep putting money in our pockets, and they're happy with this. Why do I have any pressure to do any better?" Right. And that's part of the issue as well. You and you're packing the house and the fans are vocal that they're for the most part, not all fans. We know the vocal who are like the negative Nancy's, but <laughs> more than not, more people are drinking the Kool-Aid here, living in the bubble. Um, everything is great. They have no motivation to, they feel no pressure from the fans. They feel no pressure from the owner. They're living the, it's a dream job being a head coach of the Miami Dolphins. It really is. No, you're right. Or general manager. But expectations are very low. Sorry. Very low. You know, Chris Curry has had a lot of ups and downs, but when you look at everything, you know, uh, from 2019, which is the rebuild start, like that's where the ground zero is from 2019. And, you know, Christian Wilkins, gone, drafted year. Uh, Andrew Van Ginkle, gone, drafted year. Uh, That also year is where he really started the trade process, right? Uh, I like saying process. I've been joking around my wife. I I don't like that. But, uh, yeah, class it up a bit. But uh, the fact is they, uh, they traded Laramie Tunsil. So that was a chip that was sent out to kind of recast chips. And he's still playing with all those chips in a sense that part of that deal was parlayed into your Jalen Waddles, your Javon Holland, your Bradley Chubbs. So there's still that mixed with his guys, Jalen Phillips, Tua. He let Robert Hunt go. He let Brandon Jones go. But what the market said with the millions of dollars given to his guys is that he's a solid drafter. The trading 
say what you want, but now he's going to drift another first rounder finally and a second rounder. And then we have a little bit of that wishy wash as mentioned, but I can't kick Greer out until seeing what happens this year. Now, okay. if they don't win the playoff game, it ain't, it's over. Like it's over for me. Are we all in that same boat that a playoff it's a playoff win or clean? It, it has to be. Okay, it has right. to be okay. a playoff. I'm in the boat, but it's not gonna happen. It, no, no, I'm not gonna fire this guy. Right. It doesn't seem like it is. He won't right. fire him. on record. I, I all I gotta do is put it on record to say if they right. host a playoff game and lose it, what are we doing here? Right. Because well, here's the problem. Oh no. <clears throat> well, here's the problem. You're gonna pay Tua this huge contract making forty on average upwards of 40 something million a year, whatever the end right. of is being. And then you're going to hamstring the next GM <laughs> with that. Right. Like, it makes no sense. Right. That's why I, I don't think he's fired. It's like, once you invest in that, like, you got to ride this out with the head coach and the general manager. Like, once you make that move, that's your organization for the next three to five years. You hope it works out. We all hope it works out, but we don't know. It could go the other way. Um, you can't ham, like, who's going to want the job? No, like, you might get someone actually worse than Greer. <laughs> and right. I don't say that flippantly. Nobody with any resume, I don't want that job. I don't want to be hamstrung with that contract. Um, no. And that's the, I, I like this is his baby until probably the thing with Tua plays out in some level. I mean, if he, if they give him a five year extension and after a couple of years, it's clearly not going the right direction, then you can make a move. And then, you know, whatever you have to do with your quarterback, you do. But like next year, after you literally just signed him to an extension this offseason, which they will, it's going to happen. Um, that's that's bad business, as they say. Right. It's just incredible uh, what is going on uh, with the team and every and just the franchise in but general. But they're still good enough to win 9, 10 or 11 games. Uh, no, it's, like, I get it's not it. a bad season on the horizon. I get it. That's and, what people have to understand. And the crazy part about all this is, and, and I'm glad Sarney brought up the name, Laramie Tunsil now is the best player and probably the best team in the AFC, or maybe or very close to it. Top three. Like, Right, top like three Houston, team in Houston's got to be a top two or three team, like you said, Mike. And Laramie Tunsil is the leader on this team. What a, what a full circle kind of kick in the you know what for the Dolphins at this point because they made because listen that trade brought in a lot of assets. I'm not upset about the trade. Like the trade brought in enough to try to to try to rebuild and retool this team. First round picks and all this and that's fine. But now the guy is sitting there in Houston on a team that two years ago was so down in the dumps. That like I didn't even know what you're gonna do with that team. They were firing. They were trying to get rid of the owner, the GM, head coaches. Hold a prayer everything. circle every morning. Right. The owner's right. holding prayer right. circles. Right. It was a mess. It was, and now Laramie Tunsil is. I mean, the worst thing I could see at this point is Laramie Tunsil holding the Vince Lombardi Trophy uh, <laughs> at the end of the season, knowing that like we should probably have a statue outside of Dolphin Stadium, you know, for him at this point too. I yeah, we didn't even get into like all the draft stuff and all that. That's what I love about us because. If I have notes left for the next week, that's always a good that's always a good sign. At Just to be point. clear for everyone in the chat, it's yeah. not going to be a bad season. This is because I know people in chat are going to hate me this week, oh, yeah, which yeah. I don't care. But <laughs> I just want to I just want to make this clear because I know some people hear right. only what they want to hear. It's not going to be a bad season. They're going to win their 9, 10, 11 games. They'll be in a mix in the AFC. They're going to be in a mix for a wild card if they don't win the AFC East. They're going to be there. But, you know, use logic. You had a very good team last year. You're bringing back pretty much the same offensive line, and you lost Wilkins and Hunt. Hunt's probably your best, most consistent offensive lineman the past three years. Wilkins was one of your best players on the team. Like, it's going to be a little bit different. Doesn't mean bad. They still got Hill and Ramsey were going to the Hall of Fame. Armstead, when he plays, is awesome. You still got, you know, um, Holland, who's going to be motivated in a contract year because I don't think we're going to pay him before. You know, they got a bunch of very talented guys, and they're going to win a lot of games especially if the quarterback can stay healthy and Mike McDaniel can, you know, fix some of the issues he has, it's going to be a good season, but, you know, keep things in perspective of where the roster was last year, where it is this year and the moves they're not making now, as we got to hope we get guys in the draft who can play year one and contribute and guys who haven't played much in previous years, like a camp Smith can step on and be like real contributors. And if we do, we're going to be set up golden 2025, 2026 and beyond. But we need this year to kind of find out what we got, what right. we don't got, and how we move forward with 
roster construction. Mike, I'm a Dolphins fan. There is nothing in perspective for me. It's either win or get out. Oh, like, I know. That's I, how it is, I see right? these lunatics on, right. you know, X and stuff, <laughs> fighting over nonsense every day. It's like call it Twitter. We can't call it X on, on this uh, show. Whatever, it's always, always going to be want. Twitter, right? All right, that's going to do it for us this week. I can't wait to get into all of our stuff next week. More draft stuff. Sarney's going to be into his draft camp. We're going to we're going to talk about draft camp with him next week. Uh, and in all honesty, because of the fact that we're all big uh, football fans. I can't wait next week to bring up the new kickoff rules and all that. I'm so excited. We didn't even get into any of that. That was up no my Danny notes. Crossman talk tonight. Right. No, no. Sp- I can't believe that was the first time in what 40 minutes you brought up his name. I can't believe that also. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dougley, where can everyone find your stuff? YouTube.com slash Dougley Durong. Mike. Go to the website, dolphinstalk.com. Or on Twitter, not X. Or at Twitter, at Dolphins Talk, whatever. <laughs> DolphinsTalk.com and Twitter, DolphinsWire.com as well. Folks, we appreciate it every week, you guys supporting us. We're getting good. We're, I, I love the comments. I love all the – I see the likes of the comments every week. I love that stuff. I, I think it's amazing. Thank you for supporting us uh, each and every week here at Grant's Corner. The guys here, I love doing this. It's my favorite time every week, bitching and moaning. And, and, and normally, right before we start every week, there's some sort of disaster in my house, and there was another one here tonight. <laughs> I almost set the whole house on fire, but I didn't. That'll be for next week. So, uh, so enjoy this episode. We'll talk to you again next week for Dougley, for Jason, for Mike. Thank you for watching Crancis Quarter at the Dolphins Roundtable. We'll see you next week.